So, when we're using a system like my laptop or your laptop or the desktop you're using or Archer or any other parallel computer, there will be an operating system sitting on top of that. Okay? They may look slightly different, they may be set up in different ways, but there will be an operating system sitting there. And what the operating system fundamentally does is it abstracts the hardware away from you, so it, it, it hides the hardware for you, from you as a programmer or as a user, and then it gives you a set of interfaces to that hardware. Right? A, to make it easier for you to use that hardware and that computer, but B, to make it safer for those hardware resources to be used by you and shared by you and used by other people. So it controls access to resources, it controls security, uh, it controls priorities. Okay, because you may think, so my laptop here, I may think I'm the only person using this laptop, I am the only person using this laptop, I'm running a web browser, but actually there's about five, 6,000 programs running in the background doing all sorts of different things. Checking for my email, seeing if anything new has been plugged into the USB slot, checking the wireless is still working, making sure my battery is okay. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the background. Now I want my web browser to work and my mouse to move when I move it and click when I click it. So there's something there, there's got to be something here which actually says, right, what program can use the processor at any one time? How do I share the processor between these programs? How do I make sure you don't run out of memory? How do I make sure that if someone else logs into my laptop, they don't access my files, they don't compromise my security? So the operating system is there to do all that stuff. An Archer, uh, each node in Archer will have its own operating system running doing a similar kind of thing. Sorry? So we use uh, something called, uh, we use one of Cray's operating system, um, which is called Compute Node Linux. It's based on a version of Linux, but they've got their own um, subset which they write. Now, fundamentally, the operating system has two ideas of things that can run on it. It has something called a process. And notes, this is different from a processor I was talking about, but it has an idea of a process and an idea of a thread. <clears throat> so, an application or a program is a process. So my web browser is a process. Your computational simulation is a process. So a process is a running application. And then a thread is a worker which can be created by that application to do some extra work for it. Okay? So, one application can just run by itself as a process, or that process can generate multiple threads which also do some work for it, but are controlled by that process. So you have an idea of a running application in the process, and then anything it generates is called a thread, and they're managed and associated with that running process. And this is one of the ways that we can use these multi-core systems. So I can run a program on a core, it can generate eight, process, eight threads, and I can give one of those threads out to each of the cores I have available, and they'll go off and do some work for that program. They'll all be managed by the main program, but they'll be all running separately on different cores doing their work. This is one of the ways we can use multiple cores. That's the kind of thing you would do with what we call shared memory programming, or OpenMP is an instance of this. So it's a way of creating a single program, creates multiple workers that do some work for it, and, uh, and use multiple cores, and then that means Ideally, if I've got eight threads, they can do eight things at once, my program can run eight times faster, hurrah. Because it's not always like that, but that's sort of the ideal. Um, you can also do this thing where actually you create multiple processes. So I can say, instead of having just one program running and it creates some workers, I just run eight copies of my program. But each one of those copies knows to work on a bit different bit of data. Okay. And this is what we do in distributed memory programming, like MPI. This is an example of that. So I could have each one of those programs run on a separate core, and they would run separately and do their own thing. And they could all work on different bits of data, or they could all do entirely different things, but they're controlling themselves. Um, so 
for high performance computing, so you, we used to be entirely a Unix shop effectively, so everybody was running, was running Unix. Now, pretty much everything is running some version of Linux, command line versions of Linux primarily. So, like you'll have seen going on to Arch today, you don't have a window, you don't have something you can click, you have a command line where you type instructions in, and that's what they're running. Um, all, so we have this thing called the top 500, which are a list of the fastest, top fast, uh, the fastest 500 systems in the world. All but three of those are running Linux at the moment. Three of them are still running uh, some version of Unix called AIX, but, um, and none of them are running Windows. So there was, for a while, a few small-scale HPC systems which did run Windows, but not anymore, not really. Um, as you will have experienced today, hopefully, you interact with, with this system generally at the command line. So you type in commands and um, you get responses back. Okay, so you'll have a command prompt where you can type in things um, and you can get stuff back. If you're going to use headphones computer in any serious way, this is the only way really to interact. So that doesn't mean you have to do all your code development there. You can do all your code development on your laptop here and then just copy your codes across or copy your data sets across and run them there. But for running jobs and checking status and that kind of thing, the command line is still, still king for high performance computing. So it's useful to be able to, to use the command line. So hopefully that by the end of this course, you'll be able to play around with these computers reasonably well. Uh, but also useful to be able to do some kind of editing, text editing, editing of files, editing batch scripts um, on the command line. So VI or Vim is a lightweight way of doing this, which everybody hates using. Emacs is, a, is an easier way of interacting with this. Um, but we're at, most systems will have VI or Emacs on them. So knowing one of, one of those and knowing the basic commands in one of those is very useful to be able to use these kind of systems. So as I said, there's these two different ideas of a process. So each application is a separate process to the operating system. That means each application has its own memory space, which should not be accessible to any of our applications. And this is the way the operating system controls security on a computer. And actually, when you hear about people hacking computers and doing things, quite a lot of the time, what they're doing is they're breaking this memory space. So they're saying, well, my application has its own memory space. I'm going to use some bug inside the system to get outside that memory space into other bit of memory where then I can start playing around with other people's things or them playing around with. So that, that is the primary control of the operating system to keep applications independent and to keep data and functionality secure. It's this idea that an application has its own memory space and it can't see any other application's memory, even if it's running on the same computer. Okay. Um, then the operating system will do has the idea of a scheduler, which so it'll say, I've, on this laptop, I want to run 50 programs at once. I've got Word open, I've got Firefox open, I've got my emails open, but I've only got a limited number of calls to run these on. How do I do that? Well, it schedules them and it runs all the processes one after another, giving them each enough time to be able to look like they're progressing in real time for me. Okay, so the operating system is, is responsible for doing that. Um, right. And because this laptop here now has four or eight cores in it, I will we'll be able to run more than one program at once. So it does the same job if it was only had one core in it, if it had four or eight cores in it, but that's the job of the operating system has always been done, taking these applications and letting them run across. Interestingly, on a, win, on a system like Windows, it doesn't always do what you would like it to do. So if I've got eight cores on here, sometimes, you know, if I'm running my application, I would like to say, just run that application on one core and don't run anything else on that core, and run all the other rubbish on the rest of the cores, and that would give my application good performance. But Windows doesn't do that. It spreads your application across the cores, and it tries to share things between them. The difference for high-performance computers, for things like Archer, is that we set up in such a way so that each process always gets a core to run on dedicated, so that it doesn't have this idea of other things interrupting it and slowing it down and stuff.
stuff like that. So that's, you know, Archer is, is very much set up so you can only run 24 things on a single node unless you're doing hyperthreading. You can't run more than that because if you ran more than that on a single node, you, your programs would interfere with each other and they would slow down performance and they would damage performance. So that's one of the, one of the differences between a high performance computing system and, and a normal computer is the way that, that operating system schedule is, is set up. Um, yeah, we can we can ignore this. As I said, the only other, the other way the other unit of work that an operating system has is this idea of thread. Okay, and if threads are created by a single process, and they're sort of workers for that single process, and they're created and managed for that single process, what does that mean? Well, because they're inside that single process, they have access to that memory space of that program of that process program. So the nice thing about threads is that actually you can create bunches of workers for, for a process, for a program, but they can all see the same data because they all have access to a shared memory space. And that lets us easily be able to split up our, our program and things. So threads are, are useful because they, can, they all have access to the same memory, the memory of the parent process. So I can create eight workers in my program. I can have one data structure with all my data in it, and all those eight workers can see that data structure, and they can all go and work on different bits of that data structure. And that makes it easy to parallelize that, uh, that program. Um, yeah. So for a multi-core system, it's very easy to take one program, generate a bunch of threads from that program, and use those multiple cores quite easily. Standard program and use multiple threads, and away we go. It doesn't. For a system like Archer, that kind of programming works fine inside a single node, but you can't use it to go across multiple nodes. So in Archer, if we're using this kind of shared memory threaded programming, we could run up to 24 threads inside a single node, but we couldn't run 48 threads across two nodes. Why is that? Well, because the threads have got to share the memory space of the program, and the memory space of that program is inside a single node. It's not, you can't split a memory space across multiple nodes. So although it's a nice way of doing small-scale parallelism, this new idea of using threads from a single program is nice at using small numbers of cores, 24, 16, 8, 4. It can't scale up to 10,000 processes on, on Archer. It can't scale up to 118,000 cores because you can't split that memory across all the nodes. So you have to have this idea of being able to run multiple programs across the nodes and, and communicate between them. Um, when we come to something like accelerators, like GPUs, then they quite heavily rely on um, the idea of this threading thing. Because the GPU has got a single memory space, one program can run on the GPU and see all the memory inside that, then they quite heavily use this idea of threading to create the workers which run across the GPU hardware components. Uh, and actually, to efficiently use the GPU, you're not looking at creating small numbers of threads, and you know, GPUs can quite easily have a 1,000 cores, and to efficiently use a GPU, you're looking at creating 10,000, uh, 5,000, 10,000 threads. That's the way we use it in GPUs, but it does mean that you have to, you have to do, your program has to be quite parallel to be able to use a GPU efficiently. You have to be able to split up your work into very large numbers of things to be doing by all these threads you're going to put on the GPU. And again, if you're interested, we do do GPU programming courses. The other difference between the operating system we see on Archer and the operating system you may have on your computer or on your laptop, this kind of thing, is that it is really optimized to interrupt the program as little as possible, to not do all these random things that normal operating systems do. So they run a cut-down version of the operating system where you take away all the things that you don't need for a high-performance computer. So Bluetooth support, and wireless support, and demons which will check for USB plugins, and all that kind of stuff which would normally consume resources, consume uh, processor time, is all taken out of the operating system. Not on the login nodes where you're, you've been compiling stuff, but on the compute nodes. It's really cut, cut, cut down to uh, to make it efficient. The other thing they remove is something called virtual memory. 
So most operating systems, most programs, uh, most computers, you've got, say, 8 gigabytes of RAM here, but they let you run programs which use more than 8 gigabytes and don't crash. And they do that by swapping some of the data off onto disk, um, working on your data at the moment and swapping the data back in when you need it. Which is nice because it means your, pro your computer doesn't crash as soon as you open a massive file and you run out of memory. It lets you work like that. The real problem is that this thing called virtual memory or paging, swapping data out onto disk and then swapping it back in again and swapping it out and in, costs a lot of time. Because you remember I said hard disks are much, much slower than memory. If you have to take all your, some of your data and push it out to disk, and then you have to wait for it to come back in again at another point, that can really slow down your program. So we turn that off on high performance computers. What does that mean? Well, that means if you ask for more memory from the computer than it has, your program will crash. So it'll try and allocate more memory, and then it'll say, I tried to get this memory, there wasn't any available. Uh, it'll do what's called a segmentation fault, and your program will crash. So on Archer, most of the nodes have 64 gigabytes. If you run 24 processors, and they each want three gigabytes, three lots of 24, it's going to go beyond the 64 gigabytes. The programs will start up, they'll try and allocate their memory, they'll fail allocating their memory, and they'll crash, and, and your program just won't work. So we have this sort of fixed memory limit on the nodes, where if you try and exceed it, you don't get, a, oh, in fact, on Arch, it'll tell you something like OOM, uh, out of memory error, if you try and do that. Uh, so that's another thing that you'll quite often see on high performance computers. But your program, you think it's running fine, you try and run a big case, a big job, something, and it crashes, and it's not because there's a problem with your program, it's just because you've tried to use more memory than is physically available in the things. The way you get around that on a system like Archer is you, you use more nodes. You split your job up across more nodes, because you've got more nodes, you've got more memory in them, and you, you uh, parallelize further. You can actually do this thing called un underpopulating, where you say, this node's got 24 cores and 64 gigabytes of memory, but I'm not going to use all 24 cores, I'll just use 12 cores. And that means that each programmer in one of those cores has access to more memory. And you get, still get charged for using those nodes, but you get access to more memory. 